We haven't seen what's coming yet, but it's coming. The government has a plan. We have to participate in it. We have to find a way to participate in it. That's the way I'm looking upon it. We have no options. No options. Karen, I want to come to you. As, as the head of the Chamber of Commerce and a person in the private sector, um, in my humble estimation, no matter how the government presents this, this will always have some sort of retraction of cash flow into the economy for some persons. We might say civil servants don't account for money, but when most of your private workers aren't working, they account for quite a bit. Is the Chamber of Commerce concerned with this initiative or the approach the government has taken to this initiative of managing its cash flow at this time, given the impact it might have, uh, the multiplier impact it might have in the economy? Uh, well, Titus, to be honest, is the responsible thing to do trying to manage your cash flow at this point. Mm -hmm. Because very early in the game, we as the Chamber, we've insisted that our members look at the cash flow very closely. We insisted that they do a stress test of their business, even in the early days, as early as early March. And uh, to be honest, I think, um, I'm not sure, but I believe that with COVID being so fluid, and it be basically just came upon us, um, the government trying to manage um, imported cases, community spread, and all of what COVID was, was, was doing to, to countries overseas, we saw it. So we got preoccupied doing that. So by the time the salaries hit, I imagine the government did not even have time to recognize that there was no money. Again, with the shutdown, the slowdown, the 24-hour curfew and all of that, the private sector is the biggest income owner for the government. So at that point, they caught and wondering right now, what are they going to do about salaries? So I think it's a matter of, and I don't believe in my humble opinion, that the civil servants, the public servants have an issue with it. I think it's al always about timing and you explaining ahead of time. So persons, like you rightly said earlier, that persons already set aside that money budgeted for it. I think it's a matter of explaining early o'clock in the game and getting all the stakeholders on board so that they can have buy-in. So I think it's a, a timing issue. Um, I believe when that conversation was having, it was in the middle of April, correct me if I'm wrong, yes, sir, and time. then mm -hmm. salary was on, on, you know, right down the road. So I think a matter of timing. And I honestly believe, like I said earlier, the civil servants, I don't believe, would have an issue with deferring that payment. The hotels sent home people immediately. There was no warning. Everybody went on layoff. I think the government is trying their best not to do, to make any drastic move at this time. I believe they honestly want to keep their, their, their employees. I believe they want to be able to have their employees earn some sort of income. Because right now we know the, the, the hierarchy of needs right now is food, clothing, and shelter. So right now it's really about food. We have the shelter and we have the clothing. Um, I heard the Prime Minister spoke, uh, spoke to landlords to ease off on the rent issue, defer rent payments, and so hopefully those landlords take heed of that. So it's really a matter of um, putting food on the table, because like Frank said, COVID is real. It's coming down the road. I mean, and the uncertainty of COVID, you know, it, it clouds the horizon and, and the decisions we make going forward. So I think the government just really needs that breathing space, but again, is to really inform the stakeholders early enough so they too can plan how they move and navigate. I honestly believe as well um, that they could actually, the, the, the civil servants, if they were to go in that direction, they could offer those bonds to the private sector. The government can explore that as well. The private sector can buy those bonds from the civil servants and the government as well. So those are initiatives that could be explored. But I believe the government, in quick succession, desperate, COVID is desperate. So <laughs> desperate times, um, call, times call. call for desperate measures. I see. So, so in a nutshell, the Chamber of Commerce does not see th the uh, withdrawal of certain uh, levels of disposable income from the economy at this time as a major threat to their continuation. Well, remember, there, there are scaled down operations. Everything is really scaled, scaled down. down. Um, yes. People will have less. This, and even if they had their full salary, I don't think they'll be spending at that rate at all. Okay. So you inadvertently see that scaled down in spending as well. Okay. Um, so I think everything being scaled down. And I think we really need to understand, like Frank says, and I will echo it, that we really need to understand that is an animal and not ever in our lifetime. I understood it 
every hundred years. So mm -hmm. we're in, in the era of COVID. And I believe we really need to understand the magnitude of it. We see countries where persons have lost their jobs. And I, and I must commend the government for trying their best to keep persons employed. I mean, there is no productivity or less productivity. You can't have productivity and still putting out money. But we do it anyway because we think of people, people, people first and country, country. So I think um, when all of it is done and the stakeholders and the government go through the time of um, negotiation, I think good sense will prevail because it's happening in our private sector. Persons are going home. We, we try in my business, Caribbean Metals, we try to keep our, our staff members as long as we can. But sometimes with what you see on the international market, you all, almost see the inevitable that coming. Something must happen. Tommy, I, I don't want to pull you into the, into the um, discussion here as a civil servant yourself um, <laughs> in terms of whether the, the situation is, is good or not good. Yeah. But what I would say is, as, a, as an economist, um, our central bank, we, we have a particular type of arrangement which, um, in a sense, does not allow, as we are right now with our current protocols, for quantitative easing. What do you think? Is, it, is there a need now for the central bank to relook really some of its policies? Thank you, Mr. Preville. Certainly, I think that uh, given the context we are in now, um, if you look in the US um, and in the Europe, uh, the governments have embarked upon a significant amount of injection in of, of liquidity into the economy through quantitative easing. Um, our context in, in the ECCU, being a, a monetary union and a currency board, the governments have limited uh, policy tools at their disposal. And so therefore, what we see is a pretty much fiscal policy that government use in, in, to stimulate uh, the economy and to uh, smooth out business cycles. Um, so it, it, it now calls for a, a lot of unconventional um, um, strategies. And, and the, the ECC, ECCB has to be front and center in this discussion. The ECCB has a, 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 a reserve backing of, of 90 odd percent of and, and the prudential guidelines says 60%. I think that the ECCB now needs to seriously look at developing additional instruments that assist governments, particularly in, in, in these kind of crises. Uh, there's a recent uh, a paper by, by, um, by Paul Krugman, and he's saying that even in, in, in the US, we have all these the QE um, 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 instruments at their disposal. That is not even enough. And there's, there's a sort of a call for coming up with more innovative um, and creative ways. So, so yes, I think the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank has to uh, lead that discussion. And, and the issue of, um, because it's a, it's a, it's a regional, a global and regional issue, uh, and you don't want a situation where the banks themselves start having issues with their, with their balance sheets, that then it would result in, in contagion, financial issues. So I think that the Central Bank has to be creative at this point, and if ever we, we needed them now, is at this moment. Okay. I wanted to have had that discussion on the, the proposals before the civil servants because at the end of the day, a lot of what we will do as a country requ requires all efforts to be coordinated yeah. and s a certain degree of harmony and working in one direction. And certainly the, the way the government works, at the end of the day, it is the civil servants who yeah. execute. And if you have a demotivated workforce, yeah. um, you would not get anything out of them when you need them most. Yes. So there must be an understanding of so what is the situation before them. So I wanted us to have that discussion because as we now focus more on our subject, which is investment, and what role it will play, um, the civil servants will have a lot of work to do to facilitate. So I want to turn to you, Alana. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you are the investment services manager at Invest St. Lucia. Now, Invest St. Lucia has a mandate to promote St. Lucia overseas in the hope of finding foreign investors to support St. Lucia's national development. I mean, Invest St. Lucia is not promoting St. Lucia to St. Lucia. It's, its purpose mm -hmm. is to promote mm -hmm. St. Lucia out, outside. Mm -hmm. um, what does the outlook for foreign investment look like in this <laughs> immediate, I, would, I don't even want to say post-COVID because it is there. I mean, you normally have pipeline investments. Yeah. You, you refer to them as pipeline mm -hmm. investments. Give us a sense as to where we are. Well, in terms of promotion and attraction, mm -hmm. it's going to be ferocious. 
um, That's what highly, we tend to do. highly competitive in terms of what <laughs> it's going to look at post-COVID. So when I say post-COVID, I say maybe six months, six months from now. Um, first of all, companies have to deal with their cash flow needs. So that's the immediate, the immediate issue right now. And then Invest in Lucia, like other investment promotion agencies around the world, will be trying to secure the pipeline project that have already committed yeah. to St. Lucia and to your respective country because you need to get them implemented quickly because finance can move very quickly. Finance that was once committed to a project today may not be there six months from now. Yeah. So it's going to be facilitation to make sure those projects come through the pipeline quickly. They can start construction. And then it's also going to be a focus, like every other country in the world, on ICT and the digital economy because this pandemic has brought things to light that we probably knew already but weren't actioning um, quite as ferociously as we should but now there is a need to accelerate that even further so ICT investment um, and working on investments or partnerships that will enhance the skills of our workforce that's something we hear a lot about lo locally and internationally because businesses want a location that can provide a solution to to their needs. Um, so skills training that is going to be um, important, and then we're going to have to look at how we can transform Saint Lucia not just as a tourism service economy, but a gen generally as a business services economy, non-tourism. We already have that kind of business happening here. So the business outsourcing um, sector is here. Um, the largest companies employed pre-COVID approximately 1,500 people. And for the most part, they were able to retain most of their employees because they were able to deploy their staff to work from home um, because their homes had the IC infrastructure, they had the, the, mm -hmm. the Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. they were able to provide persons with computers, and they actually saw more work coming in because these are companies that assist with healthcare providers in the U.S., fine banks and other financial institutions in the U.S. So that is what it's going to be like. It's going to be ferocious. It's going to be very competitive. Um, so, so we you have to be in a, pl a place to move quickly. So you're saying that part of our strategy, mm -hmm. investment strategy mm -hmm. in the short term mm -hmm. is really focusing on business process outsourcing in, in a serious manner, focusing attention yes. on that and trying to get us. Do we have any any call centers on the horizon willing to come in or are you looking at expanding existing um, businesses on, on island? Well, we have call centers that were already committed to come into coming in mm -hmm. and those for we see as, as continuing. Mm -hmm. We have had some new interest, not a lot, because most new investment leads have, have dried up as persons are focused on cash flow. Mm -hmm. um, there were plans by other companies to expand this year, but again, they have to see what their cash flow situation shakes out to be at the end of this, mm -hmm. and then they can make that determination. So we see that as being a focus, and of course, um, investment facilitation, getting the projects that have already committed into spending the dollars and in generating the employment in the short term. I want to stay with you a little longer. Mm -hmm. um, invest in Lucia has a tradition in terms of attracting foreign investment. Mm -hmm. It provides a certain degree of infrastructure. Yeah. Um, whether it be, it be your, uh, I hate to call it a warehouse. Mm -hmm. the, the factory spaces. Your factory space and so forth. Let us work out a scenario in our heads now where we do not see much of that happening in the short term. Mm -hmm. But it is also fair to consider that immediately coming out of this COVID environment, we might see that certain jobs that persons have may not return. Mm -hmm. So you may actually have structural unemployment. Mm -hmm. And businesses, persons may want to start their own business. Mm -hmm. In this environment, is investment which are considering providing similar type infrastructure for young people, persons with business ideas, mm -hmm. as they have done with a foreign investor. Okay, um, so I'm assuming you're referring to the, the factory, factory spaces. Yes, yes, yes. Well, places to start um, 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 the, the businesses at low cost. Yeah, you know. so pre-COVID, there were plans to do, in essence, exactly what you, what mm -hmm. you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so we were developing the business case for that. We had identified areas where we were going to um, construct and put that kind of infrastructure in place. Like other businesses, we have to watch 
cash flow <laughs> right mm -hmm. now. So in the short term, we're not looking to make any heavy capital investments right now. Coming out of that, we will, we will then reassess and look at what the demand is for those, for those products. I think what we are also going to be working on um, in assisting local business in that we are working with the government, primarily the Ministry of Commerce, in putting together a stimulus package that businesses could tap into post-COVID. Um, and then we have also already made overtures to training institutions um, that we can look to partner with to help with the improvement of the skills so that St. Lucia can be a destination where we export um, more of our services to the international market. Okay, I, I know we are due for a commercial for a break in a short while, but uh, before we go to this break, I want to come back to you, Tommy. Um, the government of St. Lucia has, I believe, now completed a medium-term development strategy document. Um, we will go into this document because I believe we just have about two minutes before the break. Um, what, is, what are the key areas that are in that strategy document right now that um, can help shape a roadmap if it, they were implemented? Because we will have to discuss whether they are realistic right now. Yeah. Um, yes. what, what, what are some of the areas that were identified as critical? So the, the medium term development strategy, which was led by the Department of Economic Development, uh, focused largely on six key result areas, mm -hmm. uh, 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 free economic and three social. And on the economic side, we looked at infrastructure, tourism, and agriculture. Mm -hmm. And on the social, education, healthcare, and citizen security. Uh, so now in the context of COVID, um, obviously now we need to look at how realistic some of these are. And we've, we've looked, uh, took a long and hard look at our, our medium term development strategy. And we think that uh, some of what we try to achieve it are structural, uh, uh, try to remedy structural issues in the economy that has been there since post-independence. And so essentially pre or, or post-COVID, this will remain. And so the government needs to still continue uh, um, these initiatives. However, we see the MTDS um, now being positioned as sort of coming and give a stimulus during this time. So, so it's really about the issue of timing. If we fast track some of these initiatives, particularly infrastructure projects, we have a, a very ambitious road infrastructure project. And again, building um, climate resilience to infrastructure. We have a hurricane season it's, it's just around the corner. So, so we see the medium term development strategy now doubling up as, as, as a sort of a stimulus in the, in the short term by providing an injection of resources um, into the economy for capital projects, but also um, helping us and putting us on a, on a platform that we can uh, have a quicker recovery because there's a lot of debate about whether the recovery is going to be a V-shaped recovery, how or long that's going to take, or U -shape. Um, and a U-shape, <laughs> uh, and so on. So we think that, um, and, and a critical thing about our MTDS, when we were drafting it, we, we said that it had to be an agile uh, document. It had to respond um, to the dynamics uh, and, and the external environment. And I think COVID has provided us an opportunity to, 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 to test that and to prove that. Okay. So we're going to go through a break now. When you come back, I want us to continue looking at the MTDS. Yes. As we believe that um, my, my review of it, quick mm. review of it, um, tell me that there might be some structural changes you may have to make. Yeah. Um, we'll be back <laughs> in a while on the other side of the break. <laughs> the coronavirus spreads, each new case calls for increased public vigilance. Know what is happening, understand why, and comply. Think of the protocols as war tactics. 
Personal protection tactics. Keep six feet away from others. Avoid riding the bus, gathering on beaches, in bars and shops. Public protection tactics. Quarantine yourself if you feel fluish in case you have been exposed. Call 311 or a respiratory clinic for advice. Country tactics. Partial lockdown. Supermarkets, small grocers, pharmacies and ATMs are accessible before curfew. Total lockdown. Everywhere stays closed 24-7 for a stipulated period. Team tactics. Don't only follow the protocols. Be a protocols police. Let's win this. Together let us win this war. So you shall be a soldier. Together we can beat this corona. Welcome back. Uh, we're discussing this evening here from the studios of the Government Information Service. Um, a topic that focuses on uh, investment. Investment as part of the tools that need to be deployed um, in the roadmap to recovery post-COVID-19. Before the break, I was, uh, we were speaking, we were hearing from Mr. Tommy Descart, who is a chief economist in the Ministry of Economic Planning. And he was basically telling us that there is, in fact, a medium-term development strategy document that, if it were to be used, would help fast-track um, certain changes, some of them structural in nature in the economy, that would facilitate um, a more agile economy and an economy that could um, bounce back, as it were, from COVID. Now, Tommy, I took a quick look at the MTDS and... Um, it makes the point that the goal of sustainable um, and inclusive growth requires a shift towards a private sector-led um, model. I'm sure Karen, Karen would be happy to hear that this is being <laughs> confirmed <laughs> over and over again. Yes. The plan acknowledges the need for a private sector development strategy. However, I must tell you, when I look at the document, it is silent on any initiatives to be pursued in the medium term in the plan. What's the plan? Thank you very much again, Mr. Prevel. Um, so the medium term development strategy and, and how it was uh, uh, developed was that it was a, a very consultative process, um, highly consultative. And, and out of that emerged six key result areas, as I would have said earlier. The thinking uh, around having a, a, a truncated list of initiatives is that in our legacy development planning documents, what you've seen is a sort of a laundry list of initiatives that creates a sort of a prioritization failure because now the government has maybe two, three hundred initiatives in, in a document. How do you realistically prioritize all of these? And, and that, that becomes a challenge. Mm -hmm. And to, to, to see genuine and lasting transformation of the, these, these sectors. So, so that was so, sort of the rationale for having a more truncated list of six key result areas and also considering that you have the fis fiscal constraints in terms of your, your ability on the revenue side, but also human resource constraints. So I want to contextualize that first and foremost. However, when we crafted the, the, the MTDS, we saw that um, although there are no specific initiatives that is geared towards the private sector, we, we saw that some of the strategies in there created for a, 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 an environment that facilitates private sector development. So for instance, the issue around education upskilling your, 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 your labor force. So the, the MTDS six at the end of the cycle to have a total of uh, 7,500 uh, individuals that are, that are trained in TVET. I must, who I, now must, can I must intervene and say your MTDS is 2020 to 2023. Yes, yes. So you, you're you, you we, 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 I understand that, yes. but I'm saying now, now, we, in the next six months. Yes, yes. So in the next six months, now, if, if you realize how, I mean, the, how the MTDF now fits into this whole recovery strategy and so on. So there's a sort of a triage approach we see the government taking. One, we, we are re responding to the public health um, sit situation now. Mm -hmm. And so what that has happened is that you've closed your, your, your borders, you, you are now, um, you have social distancing that impacts aggregate demand and so on. Uh, then we see the, the government move to the second phase of um, the, the social stabilization initiatives, where you now have NIC coming in and giving that sort of income support, acting as a sort of automatic stabilizer in the economy. But at the same time, your economy is taking a, a significant blow, right? Then the government is now moving the third phase in terms of a, a economic recovery and resuscitation strategy. Now, we see the MTDS now through the capital projects. 
if you start capital projects a lot earlier, because the, the, uh, the timing of when we wanted to start some of our significant projects was later on in the year. If you start this now, you now have a, a, a full construction, you will see a significant stimulus. And, and that's how we see the, and, and the good thing is that a lot of the, the projects, are, pro, are, are, are the, the funding is already secured with, with your, your MDBs, your, your World Bank, your CDB. So it's not an issue where the government needs it's to raise bonds and so on. So, so you, are, you have a certainty that you have these resources. Yeah. But the construction sector now is a, a sector that, that you could mobilize very quickly. You know, it's very labor intensive. Mm -hmm. The last I checked, it was um, about 8% of the labor, the labor yeah. force. Mm -hmm. um, and I still think that there's excess capacity there that they could absorb that supply of labor. So, so we see that the construction sector has to play a critical role. And then the multiplier effect. You know, you, the transmission mechanism through wages, mm -hmm. then it goes into the retail sector. Then the, the retail sector now who may have, have let, uh, uh, um, let go of individuals, start to re-employ individuals. Yeah. And then you have a sort of that multiplier effect. And, 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 and that stimulus now results in, in a greater output and, and puts the, 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 the economy in a good stead. So hopefully once COVID kind of, we can now jumpstart and continue our structural reforms that we want to achieve in the MTDS. And added to that, I think construction sector is sort of a, that induce uh, confidence in the, in the economy. Generally, uh, people have a perception that the economy is doing well when you see construction activity. You see people going to work on construction sites. And we see the MTDS being strategically placed and a sort of a lifeline to the government now. Just imagine you had a very meager uh, a capita capex in this time, and now you had to go on um, fine resources. Fine resources. Mm -hmm. So, so we are in a very. Uh, so you're saying Saint Lucia is in a good position now uh, to execute some of its public sector investment programs. Yes. The question the public always ask is, who gets those projects? Yes. So public procurement processes would have to be transparent. Yeah. Labor force would have to be more labor intensive mm -hmm. as opposed to capital intensive. Yeah. Uh, what guarantee? What are you from the Ministry of Planning? telling the public tonight in terms of that those key issues yes. that people say okay you do it but i want to see how the how so so transparency two so two in things. public procurement in mm -hmm. procurement issues such so, as so so again all of most of the initiatives are project finance through mdbs multi multi multinational development banks who have rigorous uh, uh, um, criteria in terms of how you go about um, procuring contractors and so on for the project. So, so we can't run away from that, even in the, in the context of COVID. So that is, there is going to be, um, and I think the, 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 the multilateral agencies are even mindful of that and playing a, a, a very close eye to this. The, the, the issue of the labor, um, ensuring that it's very labor intensive. I would like to say that most of the projects are at the commencement of the cycle of the construction fees. And that's generally the, the period where it's very labor intensive. And so we see that, um, you won't just have um, uh, projects happening and it's just a few persons. We anticipate that because of the magnitude and the size of the, the projects that will be embarking upon, it will um, absorb a significant supply of, of the, the excess labor that we see in the economy. Exactly. And so Very good. Sounds like good news. I think the private sector, I, yeah, Karen, I will be encouraged <laughs> by yeah, that. And I just want to add to it as well. And I'm certain that we, not only the projects um, by the government, but also private citizens, I'm certain, have projects who are in the stages of negotiation. Maybe um, a government ministry is ho holding up some part of it. Um, so we <laughs> need to, and we will actually, um, we are proposing a local investment forum, mm -hmm. um, investor forum, the chamber that is, where our local investors can come and present and identify those projects that they have in the pipeline and trying to get jump started for the longest while. And for one reason or the other, um, it's being held up, whether <laughs> it's by the, the ministry or whatever. So some sort of intervention would be required so we could get our own private citizens who have those projects um, yeah. to develop, yeah. get, get it going as well. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So the chamber is on board. Frank, I want to turn to you um, quickly. Um, the government, through the Ministry of Economic Planning, is telling us that they will be executed, and the Prime Minister did in fact allude to some of those projects in the recent debate on the estimates. The National Insurance Corporation um, is one of, is perhaps the only entity in St. Lucia which has a mandate to legally um, collect contributions from persons to secure their pensions. 
Of late, however, due to COVID-19, the NIC has been called upon to serve in the role of an unemployment agency or, if you want to say, <laughs> providing financial support to contributors. Will this initiative impact the ability of the NIC to meet its mandate as a pension provider? <laughs> That's a question I, I know I heard the, the um, chairman of the NIC speak to it, but um, the question has not gone away. So as deputy chairman, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know that we have been called upon to serve in the role of an unemployment agency. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that. Um, we, we got involved in this situation purely because of this, the, sudden, um, the sudden termination of the employment of a massive part of the workforce. And um, we felt it was our duty to assist those workers. It, 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 was, it was sudden, and I think that we had a realization those persons would contribute towards the, towards, the, um, towards the fund. We could not just turn away. Contrary to what much many people are thinking, it was something that we felt we could, we had a moral obligation to assist those persons. And so we, we got involved in this um, sort of accidentally, if you will, but it was a good thing. Um, in, in terms of meeting our mandate as a pension provider, there is no question about it. The um, NIC is a, is a solid, stable financial institution. Um, our last actuarial report indicated that our, our depletion date is probably 19, uh, 2050 or thereabouts. But naturally, funds don't, are not allowed to deplete. So that when he comes for his next examination, we will be looking at how we can um, ex extend the fund. Um, the, the, but there's absolutely no question about us being able to meet um, our obligations. The NIC, we might be, some people may, may find this difficult when it comes to actually doing our due diligence in respect of persons who come and make all sorts of claims. And, they, and those persons now walk away and say how difficult we were, we don't want to spend the money, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. But that is part of our responsibility. We have to do that and protect the funds we have so that we don't literally fritter it away on, on, on this activity. But in, res in regard of the impact of this um, contribution we're making towards the, 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 the COVID-related disaster, in no way does it affect the, the, the fund. Absolutely not. Well, that's in fact, when I remember when we were discussing it, I think we were told that um, the, the impact of this would be to bring forward the um, the, the depletion did by possibly about seven months, I think, which is in the region of 2049, 2050. Mm -hmm. And if we were to sort of push it back to the original date, given the current rates and so on, it probably would merit a slight increase in, 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 in contributions, probably about 25 basis points, not very much. But certainly we are very far from the image that some people are trying to play, um, portray. Mm -hmm. the so the NIC is solid, it is Absolutely. stable. As and, as and, and, and we need not worry. Need uh, not I, worry. Just on a side, on a side, given that all of this talk about stability and everything, we do not anticipate in the short term, therefore, that there will be discussions about extending the age by which people can benefit from the retirement, meaning we don't see moving from 65 to 70 as a result of this. Neither do you foresee anyone saying, let us increase the contribution from 5% to 10% by each party. I'm saying the status quo remains? No, we, we don't an anticipate that. Like I say, we, we've got a, an actual review coming up in June or thereabouts, June, July. Mm -hmm. um, and naturally, the, the actor is going to look at all those aspects of things. Mm -hmm. But as of now, I can tell you safely, that has not come into any conversation whatsoever. And we'd be purely by, be guided by what the actuary says. As, as of now, I recall in the last actual review, there were a couple of matters, I think, that we were, we were supposed to implement, but the, governor, the government has those documents. I can't remember the exact details, but certainly nothing in terms of increasing contributions or pushing back the retirement age. That's not on the table at all at the moment. Excellent. Very encouraging. Now, Frank, the NIC is a major investor in this country. The NIC has a history of investing in... Um, or undertaking investments in the national good. But overly, there are, there are a number of investments that have given um, cause for pause. Uh, persons have asked uh, questions with respect to 
the nature of the investments made, whether they, they meet the qualifying criteria as an investment, given that there are serious questions over the capacity to generate uh, an expected return. Um, in that environment, going forward, I anticipate the NIC will have to continue to play a key investment role as we come out of COVID-19. So please tell us, what are some of the, the processes um, that are undertaken in deciding on what investment that the NIC gets involved in? Please. Uh, again, our, uh, the, the attention was drawn to us because of uh, two investments I think that we made, yes, which yes. in my, our mind mm -hmm. did, you not mention them, did, did not merit <laughs> the sort of attention that, uh, that, that, that we got. But um, the, the investment process in the NIC is fairly rigid. There is an investment policy which um, lays down what we can invest in, the terms on which we can invest in, what instruments, what companies, etc., and so on. And we do try to stick to that. Not rather we do, we do stick to that fairly rigidly. Um, it also indicates in terms of um, in instruments, what sort of docu uh, instruments we can invest in, for example, government paper, um, bonds, whatever. It tells us the, the proportions, the ratios, how much we can put in property, how much we, you know, it's all fairly defined in the investment policy. And we are guided by that. We have an investment manager who normally deals with these matters when it comes to our attention. He does his due diligence, he does his assessments, makes recommendations, and it goes to an investment committee. Right? Now, I think Karen sits <laughs> on the investment committee. She's sitting quietly there. <laughs> but Karen sits on the inv investment committee to give truth oh, to what I'm Frank saying. And they, <laughs> they actually make the decision as to what we can invest in or not. And again, it goes through their own processes again. And, and the, um, the investment committee is, is ably staffed by competent people, business people, usually a representative of the government. In the past, it has been the director of finance. And coming out of the investment committee, whether they make recommendations or otherwise, then it comes to the board. But that doesn't stop us on the board from looking at it critically again. Mm -hmm. So it's a fairly detailed process, due diligence done all the way, all along the way. The normal um, processes invo involved in investment are looked at, cash flows, competence of the investor, etc., and so on. So by the time it comes out of it, you will get a very good result as to what the NIC intends to do. Between the two of you, Karen and Frank, um, tell us, we will have a number of persons who would most likely be unemployed coming out of this COVID-19 and they would not be able to get their jobs back again. They would probably have brilliant ideas. They perhaps would not have the collateral to go to the bank. Is the NIC the type of entity, given the situation we're facing today, that would want to trust and take uh, a partner with a few good initiatives from ordinary members of the public and would support these initiatives in terms of new business ideas being implemented, financed through the NIC. Is that the sort of thing we can possibly be seeing coming out of this COVID-19 from the NIC? Yeah, um, more than not Titus, but what we try to do um, as the NIC is try to run those um, ideas and initiatives through the Senator Development Bank, Frank and Conco. So the Central Development Bank is set up for specific um, things in terms of, you know what we do, we set up um, yes. to do but initially. But they ask for a lot of and collateral and, and they, the processes well, are kind of slow. Well, well, I believe they're putting a proposal together um, coming out of COVID where I believe they will make financing available at much cheaper rates as well. But they also have to get the financing at cheaper rates as well. And that's where sometimes the NIC would come in mm -hmm. and other... Um, institution so more than not it will be run not coming directly out of the NIC but through the St. Lucia Development Bank um, I think there was a um, there is something in place for um, $50,000 for startup companies that the St. Lucia Development Bank had instituted um, about I think a little over a year ago mm -hmm. um, so yeah more than likely it would run through the St. Lucia Development Bank I, I, I think our investment policy specifically excludes us from dealing in the equity of, of fresh companies, new companies, simply because of the, you understand what the NIC does, 
<laughs> we, 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 we basically did provide pensions and related benefits and so on. And startup companies are usually extremely risky. Mm -hmm. And the risk is one of the key factors we look at when we're talking about investments. In fact, there are three things we look to. I think we look to liquidity, we look to yield, mm -hmm. and we look to, there's a third one I can't remember. But these are the three things at the, at, at the for, at forefront whenever we do investments. And certainly that would not be found in a startup company. Yeah. Invariably, these startup companies take a while to get on stream, and the likelihood of failure is very high yeah. for, for companies like and that. And the NIC taking on that burden of you know, doing all the due diligence, and so yes. we're really not the bank yes. in that regard. So yeah. the bank, the bank in this case, uh, our Can, uh, development yeah. bank, most likely, yes, um, is the one. And they would have to come, yeah, with a with a project in mind, where, like like I said, the fifty thousand mm dollar. -hmm. Now, now, Karen, since you you were speaking, I, I want to put you to put on your heart um, as the chamber. Um, now, um, the chamber of commerce has a very broad mandate, a very important mandate in St. Lucia, especially given the small size of the economy and the, the, the role that the chamber plays in the economy. However, it seems to be driven primarily by entities involved in distribution, um, mainly of imported goods. Some might say at the expense of domestic goods. Um, how do you respond to this? Well, Titus, as you know, um, Again, the private sector, and yes, it's driven mainly by um, distribution, but not only distribution, but as you know, we're one of the main income owners for the government, the government income owner. And um, the goods that are imported, that's where the governments get their money, at the ports, so the goods are imported. But far, far so that 80% of the very inputs that we have our local producers putting into the goods to manufacture comes at a high cost. The energy cost of manufacturing is very high. So you find those goods are not competitive when it comes to offering it to the market. Um, unless you find another mechanism for the manufacturers to work by to cause those goods to be cheaper, of a better quality, and that can get onto the international market, which in turn will bring the foreign um, revenue to the island, then we, we really have to consider continuing and again the basket of goods that are manufactured here <coughs> locally uh minute compared to the uh, the the amount of goods that we actually bring in um various um goods that we bring in then we have the issue of our consumers and having to ensure that our com consumers are satisfied everybody with globalization and e-commerce everybody's online they're shopping so our our members distributors, importers, will want to bring those goods to make them available. So you have the, the issue of availability, you have the issue of price, quality. So it's really striking a balance, but unless, like I said, we get manufacturing, the cost of manufacturing done, um, down, sorry, and it, it being able to um, compete with the imported products, I think we would have that issue um, far beyond now. So consumer taste critical costs and therefore uh, implied with that is the margin that's correct so our St. Lucian goods on a real estate in a supermarket the s limited space shelf space they have the supermarket would want to put on that shelf a, a product that gives it it's the highest margin possible with the quickest turnaround around possible and our goods generally have a smaller margin even if they have quick data out. So we have a dilemma. Mm -hmm. uh, is the Chamber of Commerce of the posture now, given COVID-19, where entities or private businesses that are involved in distribution may want to work closer with the manufacturers? What does that mean taking shares in their companies? Whether the, those companies, the manufacturers, are willing to, to integrate closer with the distribution system are you having that type of discussion? Is that happening? Is there a thinking in this country today that says, um, what can we do together? Because in most countries where, I, I, where you have a chamber of commerce, the Chambre de Commerce, the chamber of commerce is an all-inclusive mm -hmm. club mm -hmm. where manufacturers and distributors are sometimes similar owners where they own shares in each other. 
what are we thinking in the chamber now in this environment? Well, certainly there are synergies um, mm. to that notion you have. But you have to remember as well, we are not only representing the manufacturer, we represent some manufacturers, we represent yes. distributors, we represent yes. retailers, hotel accommodation persons, the, you know, the, a, a wide, like you said, a, a large mandate. So again, we are not sectorially focused or biased. Um, we continually seek to bring our members together so that we could, we could partner, we can barter, we can um, bring those who have the resources. Um, for example, I know Massey at one point, um, I'm not sure if they're doing it anymore, but they were um, closely linked with the agricultural sector I, um, at mm -hmm. one point or the other. So things like that. But you find certain sectors go off on their own because they have their own agenda that they're trying to push. Yeah. But again, um, the synergies, I think it's important. But at the same time, our distributors on the other hand, some of those, they themselves would want to cut out the middleman and go direct to the consumer because already their pro produce or their, 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 their goods are already expensive. So they would want to cut out the middleman and go direct to the consumer. Um, some of them export. So they would have a local distributor out in the export market, but within the, the country itself, they prefer to go to the supermarkets or go to the, the um, wholesalers and present the product themselves without going through the distributor. Okay. And yes, you're right. Um, the, our products do sometimes have um, little prominence on the shelves, and I think that can be corrected. I think it's an easy correction. Um, but at the same time, um, the quality of the product, like I mentioned earlier, has to be something that is competitive enough for our local consumption. And, and we do have manufacturers who have quality products. Make no mistake, they, they subscribe to international standards. Their products are out there. But what we need to do is to get a lot more of government intervention as well, where our manufacturing sector is concerned, where we could have that injection of the technology, we have the injection of those technical persons who can assist. And like I said, again, the manufacturing sector, most times, um, they, they, they get the concessions to be able to manufacture, they get protection. But at the same time, getting the protection, getting the, the, the concessions, the government is not getting any revenue when they get the concessions. The way the government will get a revenue is when we export. And we, we get foreign direct, in, we foreign get the foreign, foreign revenue. Change. So we have to, it has to go beyond just supplying our local economy when we talk about manufacturing. Or else we, 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 we spin in top in mud, really. Okay. I, want, I have to go to a break now, but when I come back, I want to pursue the discussion with you, Karen, on the type of intervention government could possibly make to have our local goods and services, uh, in this goods, Mo make a more prominent appearance on our distribution service in St. Lucia. Um, we'll be back in a while to continue this, this discussion from the GIS where we look at the role of investment in a post-COVID environment. With all that's happening around us, simple adjustments are necessary to keep us all safe. When calling 911, we may need a little more information to deploy the right personnel and protocols. You may be asked about your travel history, signs and symptoms, contact and movement history, and whether others in your household are exhibiting similar symptoms. Please, be patient and cooperative during this time to ensure you receive the best possible care while keeping our first responders safe. Welcome back. We're discussing here from the GIS um, investment as it's as the role it can play in a post-COVID environment as we s try to map out our recovery from where we are. Before the break, we were speaking with Ms. Karen Fontenelle-Peter, who is the president of the Chamber of Commerce and the general manager of Caribbean Metals. And Karen, you're making the point before the break that um, government needs to play perhaps a more critical role in assisting um, private enterprise in making their, their products, uh, getting their products uh, on the shelf. And one of the areas you did mention, but I think it, it, it goes without saying, is the whole area of research, research and development of, 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 of um, goods, because it typically our businesses do not have the kind of capital to themselves undertake the necessary research. 
is the private sector looking at um, ways they could work with government in some common research type facility uh, so that each man doesn't have to go about trying to figure things out on himself. But there could be a common pool where research is done um, to assist a, a wider cross-section of, of our private sector. Yeah, well, um, we constantly lobby with governments, especially when our members have needs. And um, for me, um, the cost of energy is one of the major challenges. And we know that we have 25 kilowatts of power that is now given, so it eases the burden. But for me, it's not enough. Um, we have to move. I know there was a move to increase that kilowatt power from 25 to 50 or beyond, but that is taking some time. So I think the quickness in which we move to get those initiatives and those legislation in place, that it's killing us. We, mm -hmm. we, we sit there and we wait for it. Um, so again, um, Article 164, the Chamber, we, we have been promoting it. We have put all our energies behind it and we have agreed that this should come into in effect to assist our local manufacturers and that is in effect as well. So we promote this and we get this going. Uh, getting, getting our goods on the international market, getting the goods there, finding the markets. Because like I said, the goods cannot be manufactured and just be kept here for local consumption. Yes, yes. How do we get it out there? We get it out there because we have, and we can get it out there because we have low cost for manufacturing. It's competitive. It's of the highest international standards. But we need intervention from government for technical support, IT support, um, grant funding, um, making lands available, um, a whole host of things. But yes, our chamber is, is um, committed to um, seeking and ensuring that our members get that sort of support, especially now COVID has now revealed so much to us that we need to be so much more self-sustent and we also need to be able to feed ourselves as well. So um, agriculture sector, for example, um, what are we doing with that? We need to be able to take a, a, an approach of agriculture like never before because we see what COVID has done. So again, um, all of those things come to the fore with COVID. It has revealed a lot of our, um, our weaknesses and um, the things that we can do and the things that governments can do to assist in that process. So again, um, it's something we take in a very close look at um, to see how we can get our members um, the products on the supermarket shelves with prominence and outside of St. Lucia, the region, and international. I want to come to, to you, Tommy. Um, uh, Karen just mentioned a couple areas there that fall, I believe, squarely within the area of public policy and action. The issue of energy. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is also part of the medium-term development strategy document. Um, how serious are we in a really addressing this energy issue? I'm not even going to go into the details with respect to how many kilowatt hours uh, that a private yeah. entity could have now vis-a-vis -vis what mm -hmm. they're asking for. But just the approach to energy. We seem to have a lot of discussion, yeah. but not much action. Mm -hmm. So uh, regarding the issue of energy, ob obviously it's one of the areas um, that impacts the, the business climate and ease of doing business and we, we see that that's, that's a critical issue. Um, the government through the Ministry of, of Infrastructure and the, the energy unit um, have been pursuing a, a national energy transition strategy. Um, the government has also established the NUC as a regulator in the environment um, and, I, and um, I think the mandate of NUC is not just to regulate but also to ensure that the, 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 the utility companies are, are incentivized to sort of reduce their cost. Now I do know that um, currently we have a, a, a sort of, um, there's plans to strengthen the institution uh, and the capacity at the NUC to become that sort of agency that, that not just regulates but also, you know, provide that sort of research and, 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 and so on to, and in a sense, to assist and give some guidance to, to, the, to the sector. Um, but I would admit that a lot of the interventions um, on the energy side, um, especially renewable energy and, and so on, has been more public sector focused. So you see a lot of the focus is around um, greening your and, and going with re renewable energy and, and, e and efficient energy interventions in the public sector. 
um, in your schools. We have initiatives in our schools. We are seeing currently the government is doing some work on on your street lightings with with foot, um, so photovoltaic. You know, photovoltaic and so on. I, I think now now is the time that we now need to seriously look at how we engage the manufacture the manufacturers in terms of probably giving them some of the the the, the, um, the know-how and the technical competence that. That, that is possessed at the Ministry of Infrastructure so that they can sort of in, uh, give guidance to the manufacturing sectors in terms of the, 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 the energy efficient technologies that, that, that they can look at. What are some of the, the, the stuff and probably even look at um, a sort of uh, creating a, 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 a sort of a mechanism where you could bulk buy these, these things, you know, um, so that you can get that kind of, mm -hmm. of cost reductions and so on. So I see there is merit in terms of the government um, engaging the private sector a lot more um, where renewable energy and energy is concerned. Obviously the issue around the lowering of tariffs in a very real way, um, there, there's a lot of challenges around that. And, and, and in small countries, you know, um, the, the research has shown that you need at least a, 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 minimum. a, a minimum of maybe 150 mega kilowatts in order to get that, that sort of savings. Mm -hmm. so, so we see that um, the re renewable energy and energy efficiency um, um, solutions probably is the best best vehicle to, to do that, and I think it's 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 an opportunity for us to now work very closely with the sector, uh, the private sector in, in, in achieving. You that. know, I must tell you, when I looked at the medium too, I didn't see anything <laughs> in there between 2020 and 2023 in terms of action. Yeah, uh, it, it was very very <laughs> blank, um, yeah. and I, I say so because I think the urgency it's it's. Perhaps at the time the medium term strategy was prepared, the, the, the COVID was not the issue. Yeah. But I'm saying now perhaps it, it needs to be reduced. Yeah. Yes. Um, because the whole issue, uh, which is the point Karen is making, the high cost of yeah. production yeah. is really p placing a challenge yeah. on the, the competitiveness of yes. our, our yes. locally yes. manufactured goods. Yes. Yeah. And um, having, having a more, a more uh, this is a more, more emphasis on energy efficiency and by that we're talking about cost mm -hmm. also, mm -hmm. um, it cannot be something that is left to chance. It mm -hmm. needs to be focused on, and it must be part of the medium to yeah. today, yes. not... You know, I, I think when, when, when we did, and again, there were a lot of assumptions around how we went about doing the, the medium term development strategy. And again, I, I, I refer back to my initial point that, that we had a truncated approach to this. We know that um, these we were targeting some of the structural um, um, issues at the time. Um, but what, the, what the, the, the medium term development strategy was, it, it was deliberate in that it mentioned key areas in, in a sort of, of, of endorsing that these are areas that, that needs attention. However, at the time, the government through the MTDS could not give that kind of priority action because you had to prioritize these in interventions. However, now in the context of COVID, again, the, the document being an agile document, there is room in order to prioritize these, in, these, in, these in, and, and so from the, the Department of Economic Development. And, and one of the things I'm realizing is that development planning is very dynamic. You, you put something on paper, and then you realize, hey, that probably you know we missed out something. There's a, n a new thing has emerged, and now you need to re reorder your resequence your initiatives, bring something in. And so uh, I want to re reassure you that the medium term is, is, a, is a living document. And the Department of Economic Development is um, is is um, is is committed to ensuring that we look at the issues around the energy. We know that there are there are, there are some uh, big energy initiatives with the World Bank, um, and there are some things in the pipeline, looking at you know your geothermal and so on. There are big initiatives that that will come off the ground, um, um, and but now there are a lot of testing and, and technical work going on behind the scenes. But we are we, we are certain that in the not too distant future these things would come off the ground and someone bear some some fruit so so um while it's not there it's certainly on our radar in the department of economic development okay. yeah one of the things i wanted to also mention um is the notion of our manufacturers producing goods that um is fit for consumption by say the hotel sector for example so you find a new hotel comes on board and we have a manufacturer like Lubico doing mattresses. Um, before it reaches to Lubico that this hotel needs mattresses, the hotels already get the concessions to import the mattresses. So Lubico is not consulted. 
um, Lubico is not said, um, told, sorry, that you need to have the mattresses of this quality, that quality, this. So that they can produce it at that quality um, to supply the hotel. But again, the list of concessions that are given for certain companies, um, um, whatever the industry that is, I'm not knocking the hotel, but whatever industry that um, are we looking within the government agency that is looking within to see can we supply it? And if the consumer wants that a certain standard that we disseminate that information to them, this is the standard they want it. And if they can produce it, then by all means. But the cart is before the horse. So then the, the manufacturer is left out of the coal and not get that sort of business. The other thing too is where I see government can, um, I, I know a particular company where government, where they were looking for incentives from the government. I believe it was to do with the percentage of import of a particular yeah. product. And they said, look, we can buy it locally, but we want to be able to work, and that, that is the big company here. We want to be able to work with the manufacturers of that product that we need, we need but we need to throw money behind the technology. We need to throw money behind the training so we can buy more of that product and take less from overseas. So can you give me those incentives where I can mm -hmm. make that savings and that savings, I can put it. So those are some of the initiatives our members are coming up with. And does it take a while? Yes, it takes a while to get done. So we need to fast yeah. track a lot of these <laughs> things. I notice he's not in his head. He may if, if, I, if I may add, I think um, one of the areas I, I have always <coughs> felt that the government can come in, quite apart from the incentives, is using its, its expenditures to stimulate these sectors. So I have always had the point where um, the government buys a lot of furniture. Uh, um, if, if there they, they are furniture companies mm. locally, yeah. the government can use its, 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 exactly. its, its, its expenditure on goods and services to somewhat su support that sector. Yeah. We, we see in the case of um, some of the school feeding programs, um, the government is now trying to stimulate the agricultural the sector food expense. Yes. So there is some, some sort of um, uh, leveraging some of these the government expenditure and, uh, um, towards supporting the sectors, not just quite apart from the the, the significant amount of, of incentives that are provided to this. So I just wanted to bring that point yeah. in. I just think the sector has been overlooked for quite some time now. Yeah. And again, COVID. I think COVID yeah. is opening yeah. our eyes yeah. to a lot. And I'm hoping a lot of good comes out of COVID yeah. in the midst of all the bad. Yeah. That's very, it's very encouraging to hear coming from the private sector <coughs> and also from government because to, 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 to make the point, Karen, I can assure you that um, when concessions are granted to the tourism sector, there is a clause in the to buy to mm -hmm. source local usually they skip over <laughs> <laughs> there is also um a cabinet conclusion from since 2008 about government procurement and purchasing from st lucian suppliers first. first but the public but the government has not been adhering to its own policy okay. so what we say is not new. It's it's about it's it's a it's a case where the discipline is not there. And COVID says you need to be disciplined. You need to build your own country. Nobody else is going to and build it for you. And everybody have issues. And <laughs> yes, their yeah. own issues. So, so Alana, I want to turn to you in terms of the the critical nature uh, or need for us to bring in and make investments, rapid investments in the energy sector. Is investment Lucia a discussion have that is that a sector that you are actively pursuing trying to get investors to come into uh, into well just like everybody has said the feedback we get from investors is that the energy costs are simply um, too high um, so we have made that known through our advocacy in the background mm -hmm. what we have done in the past is because the initially the when we are facilitating, facilitating an investment. We, like the NIC, we have a rigorous um, process mm -hmm. in where we assess the investment. So due diligence, um, the cash flow, the financial projections, operations, etc. And then we rely on the line ministry to provide the technical advice on that. Mm -hmm. So that's the approach that we have been taking. So we have been tr trying to source investors that can aid in that front, but they have to still pass the technical due diligence and the different agencies have to be comfortable that they can provide the service um, that the, the country needs. And of course, meet the demand and, and 
make sure that the energy supply remains stable. Mm -hmm. Karen, I want to come back to you. Um, the Chamber of Commerce of St. Lucia operates in St. Lucia. But there are St. Lucian interests all over the world. Um, is there any thinking in the Chamber for us to see Chambers of Commerce outside of St. Lucia, so the Chamber of the St. Lucia Chamber of Commerce in New York, the St. Lucia Chamber of Commerce in Miami, the St. Lucia Chamber of Commerce in London, uh, so that manufacturers and business persons here, export and um, persons who have produced goods, can literally have their people in these countries moving, promoting, advising, partnering, networking to get our own goods out. Is there that thinking going in, going on? in the chamber right now? Well, I know our ED, Brian Louise, is constantly speaking with the chambers of commerce um, all over the world. Um, as a matter of fact, um, he's been in constant dialogue with the chamber of commerce in the UK, um, with the advent of COVID and seeing how they're responding to it and so. So yes, that's an initiative um, that we can promote and that we can continue um, or, or give more energy to uh, because we, we really do need to be able to get our goods out there so I think that's an area we can tap into and give it more attention um, mm -hmm. coming out of um, COVID. And because I, yeah. I raised that because I, I'm aware that, for instance, the government of Taiwan, mm -hmm. the Taiwanese have the, the, the Taiwanese Chamber of Commerce in yeah. Atlanta. Yeah. So, so it's not by accident that Taiwanese goods find yeah. themselves yeah. on supermarket shelves in the United that's right. States. That's right. But, but, but <coughs> we, we, that's why I was saying, to what extent are we thinking uh, as a chamber yeah. beyond the St. Lucia um, and, and, and integrating our activities with the rest of our private sector? Uh, be because it will take all hands on board to reshape this economy For sure. uh, and, and to reposition and, and to remove the, the silo type approach that yeah. we have uh, we have been using for quite a long time yeah, so because some of our members actually um promote their products on their own say for example baron foods yes. he's all over in russia he's all over the world but yes. he does it single-handedly yeah. so yeah it's an area we can give some more attention to and um try to promote and and get our goods really out there yeah i want to come back to you tommy um and uh, and I, I come back to you because the medium term development strategy document lists s six key pillars. D could you just give us a sense of what those six are mm -hmm. uh, and, and what is intended on the pretty much, let's just take the, the economic pillars for instance, what is intended on each of these? So under the economic pillars, um, you have infrastructure and under that you, uh, the focus is really on uh, the road infrastructure. Uh, so you have um, St. Lucia has an estimated, I think, 686 kilometers of road. And I think the MTDS is trying to upgrade and improve uh, almost a, a hundred, a hundred odd kilometers of road and making that climate resilient. And again, that's critical for the business sector because um, for business continuity, in the event that you have a, a hurricane that, that, that disconnects this right. in north from the south and you have a business in the, in the south, mm -hmm. that's an issue of this of, and, and, and so on. There's a strong focus around your ports, expanding the capacity of your, your ports and also your airports uh, to increase uh, the tourist arrivals and, and, and the process, the current capacity. Under. So that's under the infrastructure. Um, under the, 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 the agriculture, there's a, a strong focus on um, looking at selected crops. And so the government has selected seven crops that they really want to focus on. And, and to sort of that input substitution kind of, of thing. So, um, and, and then there's also the issue of phytosanitary standards, making sure that the, the, the quality. Um, there's also focus on, on the, the protein in terms of your livestock um, and expanding your livestock, your livestock sector. Uh, under the tourism sector, a lot of tourism sector initiatives are uh, the private sector, but one of the key ones is the village tourism initiative. So there's a thinking that um, let's now uh, uh, ensure that we move into rural tourism and so uh, a franchise is, is being set up that has all the competences to guide and, and it goes the same thing about research 
So you have the competent people, who, who the accountants, the, the marketing persons, and how, and you go into the co into the communities. You see the small uh, tourism um, plants. You give them that kind of support, and there's also a grant component to that. And we've partnered with the with CDF, the, Car the Caricom Development Fund, who has come on board, and they now are providing a loan slash grant to help achieve that. The thinking is that now you're going to connect the tourism dollar to your rural economy, so your agriculture sector, your, fish, your fisheries. And you're given a sort of a, a, a very genuine uh, St. Lucian experience, mm -hmm. rather than going into uh, the, uh, the, the plants, the sun, sea, and sun. People don't, so that's uh, uh, under, the, under the, the tourism. Quickly on the health, uh, the focus is really economic access and physical access. Uh, COVID will show that you now have the issue of, of a lot of the persons who have succumbed to the COVID have pre-existing pre conditions. We know the issue of diabetes and St. Lucia. So there's a strong focus on preventative care, uh, primary health care, and also the issue of national health insurance. You may, you may have a wonderful system in place, but if persons cannot access that, so national health insurance is critical to that. On the education side, um, it's around retooling a significant uh, a segment of your, of your population, and we're looking at specifically TVET, a strong focus on TVET. And lastly, a strong focus on citizen security, curtailing the, the issue of crime. And I said, you know, we call it citizen security, but I also think it should e extend to business security mm -hmm. because the business sector uh, uh, expends a significant, a significant amount of its resources to protect its, <coughs> its, its, its investment and, and which could have been used otherwise to, 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 to reinvest in, it, in its, its capital, innovate. And, and so, um, uh, so these are broadly the areas and also on the citizen uh, c security. The issue of pretty larceny. I mean, one of the biggest issues for uh, any young person who wants to go into farming is that uh, I, 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 someone will come and harvest this thing before me. And so, um, so the government is deliberate in, in setting up a pretty larceny unit, a pretty larceny unit who is now doing that sort of patrolling. Um, and so, so this is broadly what the, the MTDS seeks to, seeks to do. Um, in areas, I mean, uh, it's clearly I, I, I was not exhaustive in, in, in highlight, highlighting, but this is a general snapshot of some of the initiatives under, under the, the MTDS. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to you, Karen, again, before I come to you, Frank, in a short while. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the Chamber is considering looking at a local, a holding a local investment uh, forum. Mm -hmm. um, just give us a sense as to w w what is the thinking, what exactly you want to well, again, um, like I in indicated earlier, that um, our local investors sometimes have pu they get pushed back. Certain things in the government um, institutions take too long to happen. Um, we need to light fire under certain um, <laughs> institutions to get things done. Mm -hmm. So the idea <laughs> is rather than persons <coughs> just echoing and nothing is getting done, and we want to jumpstart, fast track that economy, this economy. Um, local uh, with our local investors we thought it was necessary to bring those investors together so we can have a, a combined voice as to what it is that is causing them not to move their projects um, further and we would basically lobby on their behalf and take it to the government so it's not only for our members um, our members inadvertently will benefit because obviously if someone has a, a, a big um, project where it involves construction even if you're not a member but by the time you start employing um, persons then that money is filtered into the economy so inadvertently it does affect um, the private sector and, and spending powers of persons so um, yeah so it's something we're putting together and we will bring those persons who have um, nagging questions and nagging issues um, when it comes to their project getting off the ground. Mm -hmm. Olana, is it a case that there is discrimination between the manner in which foreign investors are treated and the manner in which local investors are treated in this country? Is this a case? Is there is is there anything that you are aware of that would tend to lead us to that conclusion? No. <laughs> um, I mean, in a nutshell, the same processes that Karen's members would have to go through are the same processes that a foreign investor would have to go through. And just like her, our office has to be lighting fires to get certain things done. Because it doesn't make any sense for you to have an investor or a company commit funds to come to your country 
and it's taking close to a year to get a particular license for them to even start. The money has moved on. They've, mm -hmm. they've moved on from St. Lucia, those jobs are gone, yeah. um, that, that spend is gone. And they are the ones that are going to be providing um, opportunities for more business to the local That's private sector. Mm -hmm. So I would say in that sense, no. Where people tend to think that there is discrimination, um, when you talk mm -hmm. about incentives in particular, is because they hear these companies get 100% this, 100% that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think people don't remember that it's also based on the amount of investment that the business is supposed to be making. So, of course, we wish that government had already put in place a non, um, a more clear-cut incentive regime where it was based on this percentage of, of a capital expenditure, you get this level of investment, but right now that's not in place. So when you get an investment project, you look at how much money they're going to spend, how many jobs they're going to create, what kind of new technology they're going to be bringing in, and a recommendation is made to cabinet based on that spend. So usually those projects that tend to make the most noise, that people make the most noise about, tend to be in the over the hundreds of millions of US dollars. So that is where people tend to see discrimination. But every foreign investor has to go through the same process that a local investor has to go through. And with the addition of obtaining a trade license if they want to operate and an alien land holding license if they need to acquire property. The Fiscal Incentives Act was recently amended mm -hmm. to make provision for, for broad services yes. sectors under which mm -hmm. we have a number of subsectors. Yeah. Um, have you, are you seeing any uptick of, of, of use of that, um, those incentive regime? Are you aware, for instance? It would, be, it would be hard to say right now because those incentives was, were publicized just before yes. um, COVID okay. came into place. So you would, I think you will see that more six months, a year from now when people look at their, their cash flow. Okay. And as St. Lucia puts more emphasis on non-tourism service related projects. Mm -hmm. Frank, I, wa I want to, to turn back to you now and the National Insurance Corporation and um, the critical role that it, it, uh, it has to play. You've identified, you've in indicated earlier that resources from the NIC would be channeled through the uh, financial institutions, for want of a better word, not necessarily one, development bank, necessarily yeah. development bank. To, to offer on lending to um, potential, potential business persons. Is the NIC partnering with any, if there are companies or entities that wish to work with the NIC, um, making resources available to have those monies jointly available through the Bank of Institution Development Bank or any other institution, is that the sort of thing NIC would consider? I don't quite follow that. For instance, uh, we, we, um, I'm told we're due for a break right now. Um, we'll take a break and when we come back, we're going to uh, in investigate the possibility of NIC partnering with other entities in providing, making funds available to investors, local investors in St. Lucia. St. Lucia is vers min corona ek ika fè mouvman yi ek kan chay vitesse tan chak ka nef ka kouye pou vilijans publik la fè wolou pale an plas publik kon bol an me baz, ti boutik chonje distan sosyal sis pie hod yon alot ika twa vay tan Si ou santi ko pa kodyal, quarantine ko, patwe a kontak e pi lot, an ka ou te twa pe espose. Se an ekwye, free one one o be ne pot klinik yo pwe ou. Le pe ya di mi akle, sa vle di, le supermarket, famasi e pi etiem, yo aksesam avan se tet swe. Pe ya kle an ple, Sa vle di tout bagay feme a 24. Se vi protokol 
comme sortie par bureau indication santé. Nous tous ensemble, ça sauve vers min corona. Si nous tous servis Jidla à toutes les. Welcome back to the Government Information Services Studios, where we are tonight discussing the role of investment as part of the roadmap to recovery for St. Lucia in post-COVID. Now, please uh, excuse me for not having wished the mothers out there happy Mother's Day <laughs> from the start. I should have done that from the top of the program. So I say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, and I wish you all, all the best. Um, in a short while after w I, I, we speak with Frank, we want to open the lines so that you out there listening and viewing tonight may have your own questions and make your own contribution to this program and the discussion. So, Frank, I, I was, uh, we, we were discussing prior to the break whether the NIC is in any position to uh, partner with uh, private entities, um, the solution entities that is, uh, that would wish to undertake a project, a, pr uh, a, pr a, pr a project that could, you know, stimulate economic activity in the country in, 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 the, in the near term. Do you have the flexibility in your policy to do that type of thing? I, I, I'm not sure whether we do have the flexibility. For purely from the perspective, it depends on the type of investment you're going into. Because mm -hmm. you must remember the, the, um, the, 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 the raison d'etre, if you will, for the NIC, which is basically provide for pensions and so on. And investments that you make, any investment you make, must give sufficient return so it fits in within the profile defined by the, by the actuary. Mm -hmm. I think there's a minimum of 5%. So that when we do go into situations like that, we have to be certain, absolutely certain, that we not find ourselves in a risky situation, right? Now, we, we did an investment, for example, one of the investments that seems to have been a cause for concern in the, the Cabotan situation at, at, um, at, at Cap Estate. And some people have the impression that we gave money to, 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 um, to Cabot. But in fact, all we did was we lent them money, it's an investment, where the guaranteed returns are in excess of the 5% I'm speaking to. And the parties involved there are people who are in experience in the construction of, um, of golf courses, etc. And they have an established record of, of, of doing such. Now, if you're talking to, for example, somebody comes up with an idea of say something in agriculture or any such thing, right? It's a new, if it's a new company, it's, it'll be a very risky thing for the NIC. So it's something that we would have to look at extremely closely. But I can't say initially um, how we would be able to do that if we are not in a sense guaranteed adequate returns. We, we're not built for that. I we're see. not venture capitalists, put it that way. But if you have a solution business that has, that is as competent as a cabot type entity. Then certainly we would. Once it fits we certainly would. Uh, once it's established that they do have the, the what it takes, they, they have the finances, they have the competence, etc. and so on, we've done, they've got a solid business plan, right? There'd be no reason not to do that. I think we are about to take some calls. I don't have the number with me on the screen just yet. Um, and so just before, yes, we have the number up now. It is 468-2162. 4682162. You may call in on that line to make a contribution to the program this evening. Um, I don't know if we have any calls yet. I think we do have a call. Yes. Good evening. Hello. Yes, good evening. Hello. Hi. Hi, Hi good evening. Yes. Yes, I was just wondering um, because of the COVID 19 restriction, um, would that affect the integrity? of the actuarial review of NIC, um, I'm uh, because I'm wondering if the, the actual review will have to be done remotely, and would that be an issue? I'm not sure if the actual actuaries actually come from St. Lucia, if they come from overseas. Um, secondly, I want to know what role would the traditional SUSU play in the kind of economic crisis we have? Thank you. The first part of the question mm -hmm. was the integrity of the actual review. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought the caller would have asked, um, given the shock COVID-19 mm -hmm. is, whether it would have caused an earlier actual mm -hmm. review, mm -hmm. given 
we, what we do not we do not know. Mm -hmm. um, but his question was whether it will be done remotely. Um, he was looking at the mechanics <laughs> of doing it. It's not for me to say. I, I don't know if it can be done remotely. Mm -hmm. okay. But certainly it was sh it's been scheduled to done this year on the basis of the results as at 30th of June 2020. So that we will probably start closer to the end of the year than the beginning. So that would be adequate time, hopefully, if things go well, that um, there's some degree of normality. We don't know. We just have to wait and see, see. Okay. how that happens. And, and Kuala, with respect to the role of, of the SUSU, I think, SUSU. yes, of course, um, people would have to continue using whatever means of pooling funds together oh. to execute businesses. <laughs> we, we have another call. Yes, good evening. Hello, Titus. Hi, good night. I think you recognize my voice. Cause I'm not I don't yet. mind recording your first name. <laughs> Go ahead, Rick. <laughs> you, you asked of what I considered a very important question. Um, it had to do with shell space number one. Uh, and we have shell space. And I, that's the second time I've heard of this complaint about shell space in this country. And I'm, I'm figuring if you have shell space problems in St. Lucia, why wouldn't you expect shell space elsewhere? But anyway, um, regarding the, the, um, the Taiwanese, you said have their products all over the states. Are you hearing me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. One of the reasons might be that they've had a trade mission in, in New York for the longest while. Yes. And we have missions too. But nothing to do with development or finding opportunities for us. And, and uh, for you, answer that, I'm going to get, a get off right after that. Um, you keep saying, or your panel keeps referring to post-COVID and whatever. I don't know where, when post-COVID is going to be, but I think I understand what you're talking about. But everything that has been talked about this evening are things that should have been in place a hundred years ago, it seems to me. Okay, so what is it that stopped those things being put in place? Like, for example, something of a dole. I don't know if we can ever afford that. Um, uh, welfare, I don't know if we can ever afford that. I remember the last prime minister saying something about 73% of our workforce could not access available jobs. That would suggest to me some 73%, 60% of people are out of work. And um, how do they manage? All of a sudden, it seems that COVID has, has, has brought to the fore that there are a lot of people who are unemployable, a lot of people who are unskilled, a lot of rampant poverty of the lowest kind. Uh, all the things that we are, we, we, we're jumping on as if they're novelties, uh, they, they've been with us forever. So what is it that's going to have, that, that COVID is going to do, that's going to give us the facilities to deal with all those things, including money, including um, finding out how many really poor people you have, um, uh, uh, dividing people into categories of poverty, like indigents and so on, as if that means anything to the poor guy, uh, and, and that kind of stuff. It, this, has, this has nothing to do with COVID. It has to do with a retarded country, and a country that, has, that um, and these things should have been done not just in the day of Shastney or the day of COVID. It should have been done a long time ago. And my question is, why wasn't it done? And what makes you think it can be done in the near future? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rick. Um, I don't know if my panelists want to take a... I, I think what we really have to understand is that things happen in time. To the extent that it has never happened before, usually things come along that bring things that should have happened into the forefront, and yeah. you just have to deal with it. it to, at this point in time, I think it, it's irrelevant why it didn't happen 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Yeah. The point is, if we don't get certain things in place now, we might as well forget post-COVID, post, post -COVID yeah. because we are really being all the deficiencies that the countries have been highlighted. Right. For example, even a simple, not a simple matter, but it's something that's very important, but the... Um, the, the need for working people to um, prepare themselves for disasters such as these. In fact, we talk about savings. How many people have savings? For example, this comes along, and some people are literally, from, from one situation of a relative comfort, they're absolutely shattered. And why is that? Because there are no savings. So, well, there's a lot of preparation. And it has to do with financial education also. Yes. So, so we have a lot, a lot of, of work to do. to do. I have another call. We have another call. Good evening. Yes, hello. Good evening. Hi. 
Yeah, good evening. I want to say good night to your panelists. Um, yes. Um, good night to Karen, especially my sister on on the panel tonight. Um, it's a question. I'm, I've, I've spoken to a few of my friends back home who, who actually work at the hotel. And I'm through the assistance of the NIA, or the NIC, sorry, that they, they, they've been getting some assistance. And um, I need to, um, some of them have, have said certain concerns about the fact that the NIC might be paying the hotels to pay their staff. Is there any truth in that, the gentleman of, to the NIC? Or, or, the, or the disbursements have been given directly to the staff members who are not employed at this moment? Okay. I'll listen you. to your response online. Thank you very much. I think that there's some arrangement. In, it's in terms of, terms of efficiency, so that people can get the funds quicker. Where arrangements are being made with specific companies whereby the funds will go to them, but it will end up with the employees. It's, it's done purely in the interest of um, efficiency. There should be no leakage to the employer to keep any aspect of the funds, should go all the way through. And I think the um, processes are in place to ensure that that happens. Okay, thank you very much. Another call, good night, welcome. Hi, good night, good evening, everybody. If I recognize Frank, Alana, um, there's Karen and Tommy. Good evening, sir. Good Thank evening. you. Good evening. All right. All right. Um, very good discussion. And, you know, I would just like to make add a little two cents to it and perhaps it's not really a question, but perhaps you could comment on some of the things I'm going to read there. Titus, and, and as, as Rick said, you know, I think a lot of the things that are currently coming out there now, um, this evening are things that we have heard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are thinking or we are hopeful that COVID is going to bring us into action. My focus this evening is on the whole question of export capacity. And I noted that, you know, in, 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 in the questions that you posed to Karen, it has her capacity as the president of the Chamber of Commerce. As a matter of fact, I was already aware that she was. Congratulations, Karen. Thank you. Um, we still want, continue to maintain what I consider to be the protectionist policies, etc. that has not worked, that has failed. Here I specifically refer to import licensing. We are very excited about an Article 164 that was approved something like about 15 years ago. You know, is it still relevant in the current environment? Are we encouraging competitiveness? Right? And, you know, we have quota system, chicken, pork, etc. Have these things really served us to be competitive in a, an international and regional environment? Mm -hmm. You know, okay, so I'm you saying have that... two questions? No. You have more? I'm leading up to my question. I'm coming up to my question. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Can I continue, Ida? Well, do it, do it within the next 30, 30 seconds. Oh, my goodness. Oh, you should change me, man. I, uh, I am, I am. Uh, okay, let me ask a, a blanket. Let me just ask a question. To what extent are we considering the challenges that, have, that prevented us from dealing with the whole issues of export capacity, competitiveness, that we have failed to take advantage of somebody, somebody the, 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 how should I put it, somebody, the, the benefits that are available, either through free liberalization programs, etc. I have a lot to say, but you could, uh, you could, uh, I could just pose that blanket question and open that you could answer or respond to. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Before Karen answers, I would just quickly say to you, yes, Article 164 is more needed now than before. Um, Article 164 is meant to ensure that companies that, are, that have the capacity to export right now, they are able to produce, get some domestic space to produce so that they are able to become more efficient. You see, because, Kola, very importantly to understand, the countries that are efficient today, the developed countries of the world, they prospered behind high walls of tariffs. They did not develop behind free trade. So to assume that a developing country will somehow become efficient and compete with developed countries on, on a quote-unquote level playing field is a myth. So we have to provide the opportunity. I'll say to you also, if we had no trade licenses or import licenses, you know Taolin would have been out of business. And most of your chicken producers would have been out of business today. Because there is no way they would have had the opportunity to compete from day one as efficiently as every other firm. It is a myth. And we, we have to be very careful not to buy into, into the theory. There are practical things we have to do. And we, like 
uh, and we are a developing country. Let's never forget that. We're not developed. We are developing. So we have to use the tools that the developed countries themselves tell us we need yeah. for us to develop. So we need to take the advantage of Article 164. We need to use our trade regimes to the benefit of our developing status to make us more competitive. Do we have to do more? Of course. Energy, critical. More attention, and if the government, if the public officers in the public service hearing this tonight, if Lucidek is listening to us, if the rest of St. Lucia is listening, perhaps we could focus on this one thing, deal with it, and let's move on to the other one too. But, but, but we, we certainly cannot pretend that our private sector will be just as competitive as the international community from day one. It is not going to happen. I think we have another call. Yes, good night. Yes, it is. Uh, this is Levy Harrell. And yes, Levy. Thank point, you. I am um, grateful to the contributions made by the panel. But um, I think that the UN cry coming from the majority of people and the business community is one of debt relief. And so I would like to actually appeal to the chief economist, Tommy, and also Karen as the, um, the, the person who's the head in the chamber to be more vociferous in their advocacy with regards to the central bank. The cost of funds is simply too high. Now is the time to eliminate the mandatory 2% on deposits and mandate the banks to pass it on the benefit to the consumer, to the end user. People want real relief from debt, you know, real relief from debt. Um, now is not the time for the conservative protection of the one percent who have the vast deposit um, and are possibly living off their interest. This is not the reality for the majority of us um, and people of St. Lucia. Our government can no longer um, afford to take the gentle, let's not offend approach with central bank who have the moral responsibility and the duty um, as the custodians of our monetary policy to ensure that our people are protected and our monetary policies are sufficiently um, responsive to the circumstances of our day. And I think that um, the chief economist, you, you alluded to it earlier, and certainly um, Mr. Myers has started it before the, his last intervention. I hope that was where he was going. But I think that um, my contribution is more by, by one by way of appeal um, that this is something that is urgently needed. You know, the central bank simply has not done enough um, in this very unusual and urgent time to assist ordinary people, ordinary business people, and ordinary solutions. We want real relief on our mortgages. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, any response, uh, reaction, quickly? Yeah, certainly, I think. Um the central bank has, I think, they, they started to reduce this, this the deposit, the, the, the deposit um, interest on the deposits, and there was a hope that you would see a reduction um, on on the lending side. So um, I'm not sure that that has really happened per se. And I think, uh, like the caller, I, I certainly agree that there is need for looking at this uh, um, more, a lot closer. But also, I think there is an issue of non-performing loans in the banking sector, and and a lot of it is around the mortgage mortgage side. And, and I know for, there's that sort of non uh, foreclosure, foreclosure laws. We don't have mortgage foreclosure laws in St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. And so that's a part, uh, one of the issues that for I For good reason, I tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so, um, so I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, I think banks also are critical. Because if, if I have this huge amount of non-performing loans in mortgages, banks now have to say, okay, um, I'm not sure that I want to start reducing the interest rates on, on my mortgage. Actually, actually I, we have another call, but before we go to it, uh, before I came on this program, the call that came to me was the banks were actually should not just be giving moratoria, mm -hmm. but they should actually be see, looking at freezing all payments, okay. freezing payments of interest and capital. A freeze is different to a moratorium. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and that is the, the, the yeah. type of contribution yeah. we're looking from the yeah. banks tonight. Yeah. Um, another thing <laughs> another thing is um, the but whole issue... Perhaps you want to give me a rationale for that. <laughs> well, I, we will talk about that. <laughs> but another thing that is, before I go to the call that is um, being raised, um, again, the, the banks are critical to it, is the whole issue of allowing for electronic um, online payments. Mm -hmm. Online payments are difficult. 
especially when you have e-commerce businesses, yeah. the, 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 the infrastructure to go through the banking system is very, very cumbersome and difficult. So callers are, 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 are sending the WhatsApp messages to me saying, listen, I have an e-commerce business, but I cannot get it off the ground yeah. because I have no prior experience in business. And the banks want me to have two years mm -hmm. of prior experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we go to a call now. Yes, good evening. Yes, good evening. Yes. yes. In light of the COVID situation, government has to look now at cutting costs in order, in, order, in order for it to meet its various responsibilities. And I mean, if government is not able to cut costs, obviously they wouldn't have the, the space to provide incentives for, 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 um, for business um, expansion and for business establishment in the country. So there is the priority of government to cut costs. Now we're very much aware of the fact that every new government um, expands the public service, right? There's no doubt about it that the service has been expanded by every new government. There's a lot of fat there. And government as a priority now needs to take a serious look at the public service, you know, to cut the excesses wherever they are, right? Starting with a number of non-essential positions that have been established for political reasons. Government needs to do that, right? And the second thing that government needs to seriously look at is the question of providing duty-free vehicles for senior civil servants, persons from grade 19 and up. The people who have the, get the biggest salaries in the country are the people who get duty-free vehicles. Can government in this current climate continue to provide duty-free vehicles for all public officers from grade 19 above? I leave that for the panel to answer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your observation, Kola. Um, Tommy, <laughs> any comments? Well, I, th I think the issue of duty-free vehicles for seniors, sen I, I think it's an issue of also looking at how many, um, the, the number. I'm not sure as to how many persons we have from 19. So, so while it may seem... I can tell you it's marginal. It's very marginal. marginal. So, so while, you know, so the, in terms of the cost savings that you will get from that, uh, it's, it's not something that you... Very, you know, very much. If you're really looking for money, yeah. if the yeah. government is really looking yeah. for money to yeah. meet the yes. public servants' wage yeah. bill, to reinvest in the economy, yeah. I don't think it is cutting the... Uh, is the duty-free yeah. vehicles yeah. Uh, once every five years for yes. one officer. Yeah. And it's not only... It's not 100% in any yeah. sense for yeah. grade 19. Yeah. So yes, I, do you have, I, we have I, a call? I, I believe COVID would um, open our eyes to that cost-cutting measure as well. Um, for example, persons are now working from home. What does that look mm -hmm. like? Um, working from home now, you, can't, you won't occupy an office space. So does government need, I might get shot for that, but <laughs> does government need all that office space if you can have persons working from home now? Um, can we, we, we make that smaller? Can we um, look at other areas um, of cost-cutting measures? I agree with the caller in terms of that. Government have to start looking at what the private sector people are looking at as well. Um, because we take a clinical approach to cutting costs. Um, we look at all our line items, and, and government need to take that similar approach. Similar because but COVID not is same. A, yeah, similar but um, not same. Not yes. same, but, but, but COVID is affecting everybody, everybody in the same way. So we have yes. to take similar approaches. Yes, we have a call. Good night. Hi, good evening. Yes, go ahead. I've been trying to get on board for a longer time, but I'm glad that I finally able to do that. Hey, go ahead, I'm please. A I'm a youth, um, just giving a youth perspective. Um, I see opportunity in crisis. And uh, one of the things um, I understand that in the, when the um, internet came about, we, the, the Caribbean lost significant economic growth as a result of missing out on that opportunity. And we have another era that is coming in with um, blockchain technology. And um, I hear people talk about cutting costs. In fact, I, I, I've heard the, the conversations tonight, and I've heard very little said on technology. Now, even if the case of um, having schools online and um, government um, of officials have been working from home, this actually creates an opportunity in terms of technological investment, or even in terms of moving into um, us moving quicker into um, the way the world works. And, even cutting on significant costs. So my question is, what plan does the government have in place right now 
in terms of looking at we speeding up that or we being relevant in that aspect um, in terms of what investment is being made right now to ensure that in the next 10 years that there is um, we have our people are able to come up to speed with where technology is right now and where we can work more efficiently. Okay, thank you very much for your question. Any, Tommy, you have any? So again, the, the, the MTDS, and I have to go back to it, um, there are certain initiatives, for example, ICT in education. Mm -hmm. That has been there and, we've, and the government is working around this, but then now COVID clearly shows that you need to fast track this. Yes. The, there is issue of DG Gov and, and, and um, automating a number of the, 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 um, the services that government provides. And that, you know, coincidentally kick off a couple months before COVID. And so now there's a, a sort of, you need to fast track that it, because one, it facilitates these online transactions and it efficiency you get there. But also the social distancing protocols and so it, it assists with that. Uh, the whole issue of, of South Lewis and the, the, the transition into a university college. Now a stronger focus on online schooling and so on. So I think COVID also, I mean, these things were always on the fringes and, and persons were thinking about it, but COVID says, no, wait a minute, you have to prioritize technology. And, and so we see, um, you know, even the issues, um, the issue of digi digital economy. Uh, Alana alluded to the, the business process and so on. And these things naturally lend to con business continuity because now you can work remotely from home. Um, and, and so I, the government recognizes that. And that's one of the critical areas I see from a structural standpoint in the MTDS. We now place, uh, um, you know, the digital economy and ICT front and center in our development. Private sector view on this? Um, I got lost with that. <laughs> <laughs> the point. Yeah, no, I did. There, there is, there is um, based on the comments that the caller was making here, essentially was saying, the listen, technology. how do you integrate, uh, uh, what is the focus of the government in yeah. uh, uh, using technology in this as a result of COVID? And um, I think one of the things that um, amendments that were made to the Fiscal Incentives mm -hmm. Act as mm -hmm. far as investment is yeah. concerned is to ensure that any company that is going to be investing in ICT, um, the goods would be, once you are an approved enterprise, meaning you are a business, you have applied for incentives mm -hmm. as, a, as a company, as a business that has registered itself with SEDU or with the Ministry of mm -hmm. Commerce or with the the Registry of Companies and Intellectual Property, you can then apply for the receipt of, of concessions on your equipment, right. your plant, if you're establishing a plant, um, concessions on your raw materials that be, you'll be using. So the incentives that used to be applied or made available to manufacturers of goods can now be made available, is now available um, through, I think, an amendment number 30 of 2019 mm. of to the Fiscal Incentives yeah. Act. Mm -hmm. Um, that you can now have it for a certain number of services. And they are into the creative industries, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're into um, spa and wellness, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're into professional services, mm -hmm. management consultants, mm -hmm. doctors and so forth. Right. And also um, one other service sector doesn't come to me, I think it's, well, tourism is one, but one other service sector, I can't quite remember right now. Mm -hmm. But there are four broad services sectors that are priority sectors under the Fiscal Incentives Act that a company can receive um, concessions from. I, I think we are, my producer is indicating that we have just about two minutes left on the program this evening. We have a nine o'clock um, um, cut of time. And so I tell myself it's not yet nine o'clock. So <laughs> I am going to use the privi privilege of the chair to ask um, members of the panel to you know uh, give some closing job. statements as we wind up this evening. Mm -hmm. So I said, if you're from, yeah, I I think that we should not <coughs> should not lose um, the, the or rather spill this way. We should not overlook the sac sacrifices brought upon by COVID and omit to do the things that we should do because going forward, a lot of things will be highlighted. Um, areas that we would have been that much stronger, we learn to get to do a lot, get a lot more efficient do things when we can. We live in a society where people tend to put things off mm -hmm. and w we can't live this way anymore. We simply can't. COVID has forced the realization upon us that we have to get ourselves up to speed within a certain period of time. We must not let that go. 
Otherwise, it probably would not be worth the sacrifices that we've been asked to put through now. That's the only thing I would love to see coming out of it. For example, even within the banking sector, we were talking about technology here. We've got to get ourselves up to speed because that in itself would make us more efficient. It would cut, it would serve in terms of cutting costs. It would create new opportunities for young persons in terms of careers, et cetera, and so on. We cannot let these opportunities go. We won't get another COVID again for a long time. So <laughs> we will grasp it, identify, identify all the shortcomings, and work on these and get them out of the way. We have to be ready for the next yes, yeah. whatever it is. Alana? Um, I think this just highlights that St. Lucia needs to make some of the hard decisions and bite the bullet in a number of areas that it has not done so in the past, um, particularly with getting things done quickly and efficiently. Um, otherwise, we're going, to, we're going to miss the boat. Um, everybody's going to sail past, past us, and um, we're going to be wondering what okay. happens next. Um, it just highlights that we need to invest more and get investment to make sure we have skills in place to meet the demands of what businesses are going to need and solve the, the problems in the next year, five years, ten years. So we need to make sure that we are well placed to do that and we need to take those actions now. Stormy? Yeah, so um, certainly I think COVID is very unprecedented in terms of the magnitude. There's a lot of uncertainty around it. Um, but what I do know is that it presents us with a unique opportunity. There are a lot of, it has exposed a lot of our structural um, vulnerabilities as, as a country. And I think it has spurred us to action. And I know, for instance, the government now has an economic resilience um, committee to, that mm -hmm. has put in place. And looking at strategies and amending a lot of, and, um, that, um, and it's not just um, the, the public sector, but private sectors. And so the government is responding very quickly to that. And so in the, in the not too distant future, there will be a sort of rolling out of this. Um, and I think that it's, it's, it's very critical for us as a government to remain nimble and to be agile. Um, like um, Mr. Myers have indicated that it, it may not happen, but there's a, uh, there may be a resurgence of COVID in the next, you know, who knows? And we, and we don't really want it. Actually. And we don't really want it, but we have to prepare ourselves. So, so certainly it's a, a tremendous opportunity, and I don't think that we should waste it as a, a people and a government. Thank you. Okay. Um, going back to um, Rick's point, I believe, in terms of those unskilled persons and coming out of your point with regards to um, funds being established to put monies in funds for eventualities like those, um, it speaks to our population and 60 to 65% is earning between $1,000 and $1,500. So how do you um, balance that to, to ask persons to pay more. So again, um, like Rick said, we need to have this education um, policy in place so we can have our, an educated population so they can earn more money. So I would think in terms of reopening, because we haven't really touched on reopening, there are just a few things I would like to um, bring to the fore that in our quest to reopening, that we have a systematic and prescriptive way of doing so, well thought out plan and that we conduct continuous testing, 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 and are informed by medical and scientific advice. So we have appeared to con have contained the virus, and we are on the heels of opening new sectors. So I'm hoping that we can do that responsibly, and our business people are responsible enough um, to adhere to the protocols established. And COVID has given us the opportunity to reset the economy, really, redirect the trajectory, and the direction, the direction of our econo economy and the social agenda we purport to, to, to promote. Well, it's left for me to thank you, Frank. Thank you, Alana, Tommy, and you, Karen, for your contributions tonight on the program. They were very insightful, as I expected. And I know the public out there, um, they would have perhaps been uh, a little better off in terms of information, if nothing else, um, and clarity, some, some more clarity on the issue of um, COVID, but more precisely what is being done in the area of investment and investment planning. I must say that a point was made very early in this program um, by Karen in terms of buying local. I will always say, don't buy local. By St. Lucian. Mm -hmm. By St. Lucian, by St. Lucian, by St. Lucian. Um, and it also goes to my former colleague, permanent secretaries, and procurement officers in the government. 
by the solution goods that are available that is how you will stimulate domestic activity that is how resources are going to come into the state for reinvestment and to take us out of where we are that's one of the roles we can play in this country so i would like to thank you the viewers the listeners persons who joined us on facebook um, and everyone and of course the mothers for whatever it's worth <laughs> the rest of the night please enjoy it and enjoy the rest of your mother's day thank you very much and have a very good evening good evening, good evening. Good evening.